is the foreign policy of South Sudan and the country's political engagement with the United States at a stalemate? Join us as we discuss this and more only on Beyond the Headlines. Our guest on the program is the Ambassador of the Republic of South Sudan to the United States, Ambassador Philip Jada Natana. Ambassador Natana was the former ambassador of the Republic of South Sudan to the Republic of South Africa and ambassador of the Republic of South Sudan to the state of Eritrea. Thank you for coming on the program. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, and having me here. It is understood that the foreign policy is a means by which governments exercise their political agenda and policy. What is the South Sudan foreign policy as it relates to the United States? Uh, the the foreign, uh, foreign policy in South Sudan is premised on having a good relationship with not, not just with our neighbors, uh, but uh, with the continent and with the international community. And, and, and that, of course, also goes uh, to the United States. So we, we would want to have a, a good relationship with the country of the United States of America, not just for our own interests, but also for their own interests. So that is based on promotion of both of our interests. So that's what our foreign policy is based on. What is the current US foreign policy and engagement on South Sudan? And also, has there been any significant changes from the President Donald Trump era to the now President Joe Biden's administration's approach towards uh, South Sudan? Well, I think um, maybe it's just a little, it's better to go a little bit to the era of uh, the administration of President Obama. And I think that was the time that uh, South Sudan achieved independence. And, and, and that administration has been very supportive of uh, South Sudan until the time that we achieved independence. Now, when conflict erupted into, in South Sudan in 2003, the US decided to um, revise its policy to South Sudan. So all support that we have gotten in different fields, uh, development and so on, were all uh, stopped and everything was diverted to supporting South Sudan only in the humanitarian field. So um, unfortunately that continued by the time that, until the time that Trump took over, President Trump took over and his administration as you, you know, was so much inward looking. There was so much focus on the United States of America and trying to put America first. So, um, so Africa as a whole, leave alone South Sudan did not really feature so much on uh, the Trump administration. And uh, if you still recall his last meeting uh, in the UN General Assembly, in his address, the whole address even didn't mention one word in Africa. So that shows you really that Africa is not really so much of, of our importance to that administration. So we were kind of, uh, during the Trump administration, you know, there wasn't really so much that, that was happening except for uh, some of the sanctions that uh, you very well know that have been um, levied on individuals. But other than that, there wasn't really anything except for the continuation of, uh, of the humanitarian support uh, through the international uh, organization. So now Trump has, uh, I mean, after Trump, uh, after the elections now, we have a new administration and Biden is, is coming, President Biden is coming in. But until this moment that we're speaking, we still have not yet have the confirmation of the assistant secretary for Africa, who is a really the key person who is uh, going to guide uh, what the policy of the EU will do as a foreign policy. So while we still wait for the confirmation, uh, we still can't tell, but there are already indications that uh, there will be some South Sudan because the person who is going to be confirmed once served as the ambassador to South Sudan for a period of, of two years. So she knows South Sudan uh, very well. So we are expecting that there's going to be uh, a shift of uh, policy and, and, and something is going to be happening, uh, happening towards South Sudan. That's why we in South Sudan are also preparing ourselves to engage at the highest possible level. How is South Sudan prepared to engage at the highest level? 
well by by several steps one is uh we we want uh actually to have the leadership of government south sudan of government of south sudan to engage uh with the leadership of the us both at the department of state and 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 then at uh, at, at the congress level actually as i speak to you now we are expecting uh the uh vice president uh, of south sudan uh, her excellency uh, madam rebecca nandengi madio to be leading the delegation to the un general assembly 76th uh, un general assembly so we have already gone ahead and uh, we are hoping that we will have some side meetings that she's going to have with high level officials in uh, the in the us uh, in the us administration that's one uh, the second point is that we also want uh, to engage with other um, uh, institutions that are here in the U.S., like the World Bank and the IMF, plus also other think tanks. So this engagement uh, will also be extended to the, to the point that we also uh, extend invitations maybe to them to come to South Sudan so that they can also engage different stakeholders, not just people who are in the government, but other stakeholders in the mm -hmm. Among the foreign policy the US President Joe Biden signed after winning the election was the continuation of the national emergency with respect to South Sudan. The notice President Biden gave in March of this year on the national emergency stated the following. On April 3rd, 2014, by executive order 13664, the president declared a national emergency pursuant to the International Emergency Economic Powers Act to deal with the unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States constituted by the situation in and in relation to South Sudan, which has been marked by activities that threaten the peace, security, or stability of South Sudan in the surrounding region, including widespread violence and atrocities, human rights abuses, recruitment and use of child soldiers, attacks on peacekeepers, and obstruction of humanitarian operations. The situation in any relation to South Sudan continues to pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. For this reason, the national emergency declared on April 3rd, 2014, must continue in effect beyond April 3rd, 2021. What does the continuation of the national emergency imposed and extended on South Sudan mean for the country itself and also its conduct with the United States government? Well, I think um, up to this point, the US administration is still treats the situation in uh, South Sudan as a situation of emergency. So that means that uh, no, we are not really willing to engage in anything that is developmental. So we are just going to look at things that have to do uh, with the humanitarian situation in South Sudan. So issues of refugees, issues of who are displaced, but also issues of other natural calamities like the flooding and so on. That's why that's where they want to extend uh, uh, humanitarian assistance. But um, of course, the situation will change, but that also mostly depend on us in South Sudan. If we're able to stabilize the situation, then we can be able uh, to, to talk to the administration of the United States and ask them that I think we should move beyond humanitarian assistance, but we should move to developmental assistance and partnership in other things. Mm -hmm. What is the expectations of the United States um, that in terms of in order to ensure that emergency, the national emergency is lifted, what do they expect from the South Sudan government itself? Well, uh, stability is one of the things that um, you know um, that has been mentioned, and of course, um, then there are issues of of human rights violations, which are actually um, a result of the conflict uh, that is already taking place. So I think that's why priority number one for the government is uh, of South Sudan is to stabilize the situation uh, as and as, as soon as the situation is stabilized then we can be able to move ahead and address the other concerns the, the issues of uh, violation of human rights uh, and and so on and so forth so i think that's that's the starting point mm -hmm. 
The U.S. has leveraged its power and influence by imposing sanctions and arms embargo on South Sudan and some of the country's leaders. How the, has this really impacted the foreign policy laid out by the South Sudan government towards the U.S.? And also, have you sought to have the sanctions and arms embargo lifted on the country? So the sanctions is one of the tools that the U.S. uses foreign policy, conducting its foreign policy uh, towards South Sudan. Unfortunately, of course, they have uh, uh, targeted uh, individuals uh, in the government whom they deem uh, to be in one way or another obstructing the implementation of, of the peace process. And um, we have, of course, reached out uh, at, di at different levels. And I mean, at the level of the embassy, but also at the level of the delegations that have visited South Sudan and the level of side meetings during the past uh, UN General Assembly, that um, sanctions and arms embargo are actually really very detrimental uh, to the situation in South Sudan. Um, you stop uh, arms not to be given to the government of South Sudan, but the situation on the ground remains, and that is part that everybody knows that uh, not just in South Sudan, but even in some of the neighboring countries, there is a very big proliferation of uh, small arms that is spread out among the civilian population. Now, what arms the Bago does is that it really impedes uh, the ability of the government to be able to enforce security. Because at the end of the day, you find out that the same level of armament that the government has is the same level of armament that is in the hands of the civilians. So when you want to enforce security, definitely they, they, fight, they fight back. So that basically means that it weakens uh, the security sector and uh, therefore, then it becomes very difficult to have uh, the enforcement of security. That's why you will see a few people can get up on the street and decide to make a roadblock and kill innocent civilians. We see this communal fighting that, that has been now spreading and increasing, even to areas that before were not known to have this kind of situation. So we still uh, would want to be sitting down with the, with the, the US government uh, including uh, at the side meetings in the General Assembly. And we were trying to lobby that uh, this arms embargo and this, um, and these uh, sanctions uh, are lifted. Now on to the individual levels, uh, as, as you know very well that uh, some of the individuals who have been sanctioned in South Sudan are either high ranking government officials or high ranking officers uh, in the army. And these are people that we need in the implementation of the peace. Now, if they are in the process of implementing the peace agreement and they feel that they have been punished, then I think that actually really demotivates them at a different level. So I, I just think that, you know, uh, sanctions does not contribute in any positive way to the implementation of the peace agreement. And the peace agreement is what the U.S. government supports, and I'm sure that they, they want it to work. So in order for it to work, I think there is a need uh, to lift the sanctions on these individuals and also to leave uh, the arms in Bago in South. The United States is part of Troika, which is comprised of two other countries, United Kingdom and Norway. Troika has been supporting the peace process and has invested extensively in trying to meet humanitarian needs of the population in South Sudan. During the marking of the 10 years of independence this past July, the three countries that are part of Troika, United States, United Kingdom, and in Norway released a joint statement in which they stated, due to the immense suffering caused by the outbreak of war, our aid is now primarily humanitarian, but we want to see South Sudan get back on the road to economic and social development. After all, South Sudan is rich. Its riches do not just reside in the oil beneath its land, or the lumber in its forest, South Sudan is rich because of the diverse communities of people that make up this young country. It is on their behalf that we have been a constant supporter of the implementation of the peace agreement. However, nearly three years since we commended the signing of the agreement, many tasks remain undelivered. Few of the tangible benefits of peace are seen by ordinary citizens. The Troika welcomes the progress that has been made, but urges the signatories to accept accountability 
for their commitments and go much further, much faster. As you know that we have such a large population of South Sudanese in America and many parts of the diaspora and in Africa. What is, you know, their concern about the peace agreement and how it's being implemented? There's a lot of talk that it's at a stalemate. What is the current state of the peace agreement within the country right now? Well, I think the peace agreement has been in, in, has been implemented, and I think the process has been slow, uh, but it has been progressing nevertheless. Um, just about um, a week or so uh, before we had the, you know, the, the official opening of parliament, and I think that's a right uh, step in the direct, uh, in the in the right direction because now that parliament is formed, some of the laws uh, that um, you know are there, they, they can now be enacted. But of course, there is a general frustration uh, on uh, the slowness of the peace uh, process, uh, not just for South Sudanese who are in diaspora, but even for South Sudanese who are at home. Because I think uh, everybody would want to see that um, this peace is implemented and stability returns to South Sudan so that everybody uh, return back to their normal life and start to go about uh, their own business. So I think the, the, the implementation the slowness is the, the implementation is very frustrating to most of our, our population, be them in the diaspora or even inside South Sudan. But still, I think what what we all need to do is really to be supportive to the disease this process because I think if we if it is implemented, the government is, in, is uh, has already said that they are committed to um, implement the the the, the peace agreement letter and spirit. And if that is implemented, I think it will solve most of the problems that uh, we have been fighting on. The South Sudan government has made attempts to lure regional and international investors to come to South Sudan. However, reports of insecurity, corruption, among other issues have been a deterrence for many. How are you engaging the business and investor community in the United States to look at South Sudan as a rising hub for investment. And when you are asked about the business environment within, within the country, what do you tell the potential investors, not only Western investors, but also the South Sudanese community, because we have a large population here who want to invest back home? Well, I think um, uh, talking about investment, uh, it is actually a critical situation uh, because uh, when you talk to Western investors, and especially investors here in the United States of America, there are conditions that they need to be fulfilled before they invest in other in, in other countries. And one of them, of course, is security, as we as we already stated. Unfortunately, of course, the reality of South Sudan is that there has been an ongoing conflict uh, that has just been ended by this piece of thing. So, what we tell the investors here is that we are in the process of implementing uh, the peace agreement. And um, and uh, there will be opportunities for investment in South Sudan, and we really need uh, the U.S. Uh, to invest in, in South Sudan. Just about um, two months ago, I was in Houston, Texas, uh, with other African ambassadors, engaging the 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 I mean the the business community that is there, and mainly investors, because there's a lot of interest. They want to invest in South Sudan in the field of oil and gas. And also, you know, in other fields. Uh, so, of course, they ask these very crucial questions. You know, that the same thing that like you ask: what is the guarantee for that our business is not uh, going to be hurt, and 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 so on. But um, uh, we try to assure them that um, the implementation of the peace agreement, of course, is going to you know, to result in uh, result into in peace, and of course, their business is going to be. Uh, secured, but we are not just going to talk about really giving them assurance verbally. But I think um, uh, we are also, doing as a government, we are also trying to take among ourselves the the task of this risking. Because if companies go and invest uh, in places, they want to find that actually the risk is minimal. So if the government can take it upon itself to make sure that they ensure and they risk uh, the the investors, then that will be something that the investors will be willing. So these are some of the things that uh, we are discussing at our level here at the embassy, but also that we share uh, with, um, uh, with with our government back home. Now, the second thing that we are also doing is um, we have uh, the East African uh, Chamber of Commerce here 
in South, in, I mean, in the United States of America. And it's quite a very active group that is helping us, uh, not just South Sudan, but all the members, uh, member states of the East African community. So we are working together as the ambassadors of the East African community. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, meetings on a regular basis. And one of our focus is really how we can work as a group um, uh, to see that we try to attract uh, investors uh, to, um, uh, to, to the East African uh, community. So we identify some of the projects that we think uh, um, investors would be interested in, in these six countries. And as we talk, and then we talk as, as a group, and, and that actually helped in uh, trying to convince uh, the investors uh, to come to. So uh, we will extend this kind of um, uh, uh, engagement, not just on, you know, as East African community, but as individual countries, different in, uh, investors. That is on the part of the United States of America. But besides that, um, we also are looking at other parts. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges that that we have, uh, not just for South Sudan, but uh, in the whole continent, is that really there is very little trade that is happening with us, you know, as neighboring countries and as an as a regional bloc, maybe like East Africa community and so on. That is something that uh, we are also trying uh, to engage, uh, you know, the neighboring countries and people who might be interested in developing uh, and investing in, in, in our region. And uh, not just in our region as, as Africa, but even even me. So if, if you have investors, even who invest in our in our neighboring country, not South Sudan at the moment, then uh, the nearer they get to the vicinity of South Sudan, the clearer they can be able uh, to, to see things. Because uh, what we always get uh, about South Sudan, and uh, uh, but uh, that is that also applies to other countries that. We mostly get our information on the media, and I think uh, the the information in, in the media sometimes does not really reflect the reality on 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 the ground. And that is why in our engagement, we always encourage those who may have an interest in investing in South Sudan just to go and and you know and have a look, and then after that, base their decision on whether to invest or not on what they see. What about the diaspora population of South Sudanese? What investment opportunities are available for them in South Sudan? Well, I think, um, um, it, uh, of course, investment will depend on actually the capital that people hold. So um, uh, we have also engaged and we have reached out to, uh, to South Sudanese who have been there. But I think their interest is uh, really not so much on big scale investments, but just on really small, you know? So people are talking to you about maybe, um, you know, investing, uh, let's say in the banking sector or investing in IT. Mostly these are the requests that I've already gotten. So somebody, for example, you want to say, okay, I want to um, establish, you know, a system that links uh, the banks in South Sudan the international banks and you can be able to transfer money for example because there's a lot of um uh, of remitting uh, that is going on from the us uh, to south sudan you know on a monthly basis uh, people from here support their families and uh, they always send money whether through western union through dark shield or, and others but um there has been an interest by some south Sudanese that they really wanted to establish their own system that would be particular to south sudan but maybe cover part of the East African community, neighboring countries like Uganda and, and South Sudan. They, that, in that, there has been um, uh, an interest. Uh, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure whether you've heard about M. Gurush in South Sudan, which does this, uh, a similar kind of thing. So there are people who want uh, to really invest in, in this field. There are people actually who want to invest also in the fields of um, you know, maintenance. So uh, investing in, let's say, road constructions, but maintenance of vehicles and so on. But these are just very small investments. And, uh, and that's, of course, understandable because I think the capital base of most of our South Sudanese um, diaspora here may not be able to support whatever big projects they want to do. Among the concerns that have, has been raised by South Sudanese in the United States is the lack of communication or effective communication um, between the embassy and the population. Um, they, they've raised that concern for quite a number of years. 
Now, Ambassador Natana, how is the South Sudan Embassy working to engage with the diaspora community in the US? And as we conclude, what final words would you like to share with the community members? Uh, well, that's, that's actually a very uh, important question. You know, I, I came here in, 2000, in September 2018. So as we today, I'm um, actually one year and one day, I mean, three years and one day old here in the US. Um, and when I came to the US, of course, my main mission is, uh, uh, is um, to have bilateral engagements with the US government. Uh, but I think um, I also made it categorically clear on the time of my arrival here that I would really want to work with diaspora and the diaspora class, uh, to, or to me specifically, is an asset uh, that can contribute in many ways uh, to South uh, to South Sudan. So I reach out uh, to the diaspora, and I think the response has been very positive, uh, especially among uh, young. Uh, but the reality of what I encountered here in the EU is that our um, diaspora is very divided. You know, we all engage on community level, and and, and um, so you know I try to um, uh, find a chance. You know, sometimes they invite me locations but also to their meetings so i have attended uh you know several meetings uh, that are hosted by various communities coming from the greater equatorial greater baragazal and, and greater uh upper nile and uh but these are mostly just a small community plus other uh, plus other events that um uh, does maybe social events and so on and I always take that as an opportunity to be able to reach out uh, to the diaspora and, and try to, uh, to engage them. And one of the things that I've also encouraged the diaspora is that you know, they should be able to register with the embassy. Because, for example, we don't know exactly how many South Sudanese or Americans of South Sudan origins are there that are based uh, in the United States of America. Uh, that is one of them. And we also try to sensitize uh, the diaspora uh, to try, you know, even uh, to make an effort uh, because it's easier for them really to find us than the other way around. So, uh, now, for example, we encourage them whenever I go to social locations, look at our website, give them our phone, give them my own personal phone. And uh, I don't know how you got my phone, but uh, that tells you that my phone is available, you know, to. Uh, to, uh, to many people, and I always respond whenever people call, you know, for one reason or another, I just begin calling so that uh, uh, people need uh, to communicate, and, and we try our best uh, to do the communication. Just to mention here that during the time of COVID, of course, uh, we were hit hard like everybody else, uh, that sometimes, uh, you know, we, we people work from home, and then or we work in shifts because we want to minimize uh, the number of the people that are physically present at the time, at one time at the embassy, just to not to encourage the spread uh, of COVID. So sometimes people are frustrated because, you know, they call the lines and then there's nobody answers. And, uh, you know, you generally are very short tempered. I once, and then they don't say these people are not there and they don't work. But other people are living with patient and they try other ways uh, to get uh, this. But I, I just wanted to emphasize here. Is that that's a way a two way you know it's uh, while we try to reach out we also encourage you know that people also try to communicate and reach out to us and maybe um, if you would allow me also to take the opportunity of using a platform like yours you know, to pass on the message and say that we really want to communicate with our people in South Sudan because um, I mean in, in the United States here people in, in diaspora because uh, mm -hmm. one of the uh, one of the things that we do here is we offer services to, to for, you know so consular service is one of the things that uh, we're able to 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 offer. So in instances of you know our deaths and they want to take remains and all of that, people can can go can just directly get in touch with the embassy because uh, why am I saying that? I'm saying that is because I think some people are very hesitant uh, in, in contact with us in the embassy. So you get a situation whereby somebody has passed on here and the relative will decide to call somebody in Cuba who knows the ambassador. And then they, they, that person calls maybe one of my friends in, in, in Uganda. And then again, that person calls, calls us here. There's no need for you to do that because the embassy is here to offer 
service for people as South, as South Sudan. And this is a service that South Sudan really deserve. And I've said it before, even in the United States here, a majority of our population voted to have South Sudan as an independent country. So this is not like a favor that we are doing for you, but this is your life, a South Sudan, and you have to get it anytime that. Uh, Yes, I thank you for joining me here on the program, Ambassador of the Republic of South Sudan to United States, Ambassador Philip Jada Natana. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to, to be here and thank you for us. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page at Sunrise Media.